direct from our newsroom in New York, in color. This is the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite and Eric Severide in Washington, John Shayon in Amman, George Herman in Washington, Winston Burdett in Rome, Morley Safer in West Berlin, Robert Shackney in New York, and Charles Geralt on the road tonight on Chesapeake Bay. Good evening. Tonight on a desert airstrip in Jordan, Palestinian terrorists are holding as hostages almost 200 passengers and crewmen aboard two of those jetliners hijacked yesterday. Earlier, they released and took to Amman about 100 women, children, and elderly people, acknowledging they might not be able to survive another night in the planes. But they retain custody of American, British, West German, and Swiss male passengers, along with Israeli nationals. And they threatened to blow them up along with the Transworld Airline and Swiss Air Jets, if their demands for the release of a number of commandos from Western and Israeli jails are not met. There's been quite a bit of confusion over whether the terrorists also were demanding the release of Sirhan Sirhan, who's awaiting execution in California for the murder of Senator Robert Kennedy. A Palestinian guerrilla spokesman in Lebanon said Sirhan's freedom is being sought. But a guerrilla official in Amman denied that report, and it also was denied by the State Department. We have a radio report now on the captive passengers and the planes from John Shayan in Jordan. Spokesman for the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine say after the release of non-Israeli women and children from the two hijacked airplanes out in the desert, the men will be held until all demands are met. They say the release of only the guerrillas held in one or two countries is not enough. They want the commandos imprisoned in Switzerland and Germany Laila Khalid, the veteran drill hijacker held in London, and about 3,000 Palestinians held in Israeli jails. The stock of food on the planes has run out, and the Red Cross will start this evening supplying meals to the hostages. Television camera crews tried to film the planes today. Some succeeded, and others had their cameras and film confiscated. The commanders themselves filmed the landing of the planes and the hostages and are demanding $5,000 for copies of the film. John Shayan, CBS News, Amman. That girl guerrilla correspondent Shayan referred to took part in yesterday's abortive attempt to hijack the Israeli El Al airliner. The 25-year-old Miss Caleb became an Arab heroine after helping take over a TWA jetliner last summer and forcing it to fly to Syria. She attended the American University in Beirut with a school teacher and later became active in the women's liberation movement among Palestinian refugees. During the day, both Switzerland and West Germany bowed to the guerrilla demands and agreed to release six terrorists they've been holding. Presumably, the Red Cross will handle the transfers. In Washington, long hours were devoted to the hijackings, and we have a report from George Herman. State Department experts worked much of the night on possible plans for arranging the release of the hijacked passengers. Secretary of State Rogers, who'd kept in touch, arrived in mid-morning and invited the representatives of the four other nations involved to meet with him. And a little after one o'clock, the ambassadors of Britain and Israel and diplomatic representatives from West Germany and Switzerland met with the secretary for about 25 minutes. When they emerged, Britain's ambassador, John Freeman, said little, explaining there was too much at stake. Israel's ambassador Rabin denounced the hijackings as pure blackmail and said Israel would release no prisoners in any such exchange deal. But he said the legal responsibility for obtaining the release of hijacked passengers belongs after all to the nations in which the various planes are registered, America and Switzerland. A task force of State Department experts is still at work investigating what, if anything, can be done to help the hijacked passengers. George Herman, CBS News, Washington. The third passenger jet Arab guerrillas managed to hijack came to a fiery end overnight. This was the Pan Am jet that started from Amsterdam to New York, only to make its next landing at Beirut, Lebanon, under the supervision of its abductors. Then on to Cairo, and a violent end to a new $20 million 747. Blown up by the hijackers only minutes after all of the people on board were hustled roughly to safety. Some of them suffered bumps and bruises in the scramble to get off. Others reported hearing gunfire, but apparently no one was seriously injured. Later on, personnel on the plane were to report the explosive charges were not armed until all the passengers were off. Apparently, this didn't make anyone on board feel much more secure. They all lost their baggage. The hijackers, and you're now seeing three of them, reportedly treated the passengers calmly and with courtesy throughout the flight. 
Three of them took over the plane after it left Amsterdam. Several others got on at Beirut. One passenger, a pregnant woman, was assisted from the plane on a stretcher. All the passengers were later released, picked up by another Pan Am plane, and flown to Rome, where they were met by CBS News correspondent Winston Burdett. The plane, how soon was it that they blew up the plane? Very fast, and we had no about time. Every half, it took about a minute and a half to three minutes until the, the front of the plane blew up, the cockpit. And then I would say within the next five minutes, the whole thing just went. <laughs> if it wasn't for the fact that the Pan Am crew was so great, we wouldn't have made it. The Pan Am crew. We had a rapid, rapid uh, evacuation. How fast did you all get off the plane? Oh, I'd say we were all out in about, I, yeah, about 90 about seconds. It took about it took about two to three seconds just to slide down our uh, on our the ramp that it's like a rubber ramp that you have. You just slide right out. What orders did the uh, hijackers give you? Well, they didn't give any orders. They just came around asking people what their nationality was. He had a gun in one hand, he had a hand grenade in the other hand. And where was all your baggage? All blown up? It's all blown up. It's complete ash, man. It's all ash, very far out. Thanks very much. Yeah. Did the hijackers tell you they were going to blow off up the plane before you got off? They, definitely. They informed the captain they were going to destroy the aircraft, and they were going to do it within 15 seconds after the engine stopped. And how fast were you all able to get off that plane? I would estimate in about 30 seconds. And we were about uh, from here to your terminal away from the airplane when the first bombs went off. But you were 150 passengers, were you not? That's right, but there were five doors on each side, and they evacuated them very, very quickly. It was very efficient. The crew, to be very honest about it, should be truthfully uh, commended. They ought to give the captain and the flight service a supervisor some kind of a medal. These people were really heroes. They welded this thing together, and they did a beautiful job. Uh, uh, what is your name, please? My name is Eileen Lonergan. And you are from? Uh, New York. And you were a hostess aboard this plane? Yes, I was. Now, could you tell me what happened during the last half hour before you landed in Cairo? Well, it was just about a half an hour before that uh, the, the hijacker told us that we were going to evacuate the airplane. He, told, he asked us how we would evacuate because the 747 is different. We explained to him about um, if we opened the doors that the ramps would go out, the slides would go out. And he said, all right, we could brief the crew. And we got the crew all together, the director and persons and all the students, and we briefed them on what was going to happen. They were going to open the doors and slide down, and they had given us eight minutes in which to evacuate the plane. Eight minutes? Eight minutes. Well, that's what they gave us originally. So we briefed the crew, and everybody was together, and we briefed them. And um, everything was very smooth. We told the passengers what was going on. We explained to them exactly what to do and what doors to go to. Now, how long did it actually take you to evacuate the plane when the time well, came? When the time came, I think, I'm not sure, I think it took anywhere from one to two minutes to evacuate. Um, and within three minutes, the cockpit blew up. The cockpit was the first place to go. It was the lounge. That had been, the whole plane was wired, but the lounge went. It, um, I had run, I was one of the last in the airplane. There were two or three of us left. And I had run about 100 yards from the airplane, and the lounge blew. And I turned around and I looked, and I could see... It. The whole plane was lighted. All the lights were on the landing gear and everything. All the lights were on, and the lounge had blown. There was fire coming out of there. So I think that it was within about three minutes. Now, they told you before you landed that, that did they tell you that they intended to blow up the plane? Um, they never said exactly. They told us that, that we had eight minutes to get everybody out and away from the plane. They told us to be 600 meters from the plane. Or, wait, 300 meters from the plane. But you had a good idea that they intended to blow it up. We had seen the dynamite. They had dynamite all over this class cabin. We knew it was there, and we knew that they were going to do it. So, Thanks very much. You're quite welcome. Some of the passengers needed help in leaving the plane at Rome because of the injuries they had received while jumping off the plane in Cairo. One of the more bizarre aspects of this bizarre story, a guerrilla spokesman on Syria's radio Damascus today denounced Israel's stationing of armed guards on its airliners as a gross violation of international law. There was a telephone bomb threat against another El Al plane at London Airport today. The New York to Tel Aviv plane was evacuated, but no bomb was found. We're going to drive home a point about anti-leak Xerox antifreeze. It stops most common radiator leaks just like that. 
We guarantee it will stop and prevent leaks in your car radiator for a full year or just write DuPont and get your money back. Anti-leak Z-Rex antifreeze is guaranteed not to run out on you. How about that new Kent menthol? Wow, Kent got it all together. Kent Menthol 100, brisk, breezy menthol flavor, exclusive Micronite filter, and good, rich taste. They're all together now. All the big brands with the menthol, all the good things of the Kent, it's all together. Passengers from those hijacked planes taken to Amman are tonight in a city far from peaceful. Despite their two-day-old truce, Palestinian commandos and Jordanian troops were at it again today. There was sporadic fighting, and the commandos attacked the city's radio and television stations. Jordan's government confirmed that a U.S. Army sergeant assigned to the American embassy in Amman was kidnapped on Saturday, presumably by guerrillas. No details were given out. Neither in Washington nor at the United Nations does there seem to be any clear idea of what to do to get the Middle East peace talk started again. Israel again today charged that Egypt continues to build missile sites in what is supposed to be the truce zone near the Suez Canal. And the Israelis say they will boycott the American-sponsored talks until those installations have been removed. One hopeful sign did appear today. Israel's transport minister, Shimon Peres, suggested the possibility of a fresh attempt at peace through a new ceasefire arrangement. But he emphasized it would have to contain effective guarantees against Arab violations. Separate rallies by left and right wing factions in Germany over the weekend demonstrated the nation's division over its new non-aggression treaty with Russia. Morley Safer's report begins with a Berlin rally of West Germans whose lands have been lost behind the Iron Curtain. The people who gathered in the amphitheater of Hitler's old Olympic city are all very much pre-war. The people who sooner or later fled from the advancing armies of Marshal Zhukov as the Red Army swept through Eastern Europe 25 years ago. Their presence here today is a demand for the return of farms and houses and of great ducal estates in East Prussia, Silesia, and Brandenburg. The speakers and the banners are anxious to point out that this is not a group of right-wing neo-Nazis. To give their movement a European flavor, they invited a troop of Dutch drum majorettes from Holland, most of them too young to know the difference between East Prussia and the far side of the moon both of which places are equally likely to be restored to West Germany. And from Belgium, a Flemish drum and bugle band, all stalwart young men in tight velvet shorts, whose star turn is a three-man troop whose speciality is flag-waving, an exercise popular with a crowd gathered this day in Berlin. fifty miles away in West Germany, a ceremony commemorating the Soviet victory. At Stuckenbrook, extreme left-wing German politicians gathered at the site of a former prisoner of war camp. Sixty-five thousand Russian troops taken in the first wave of German victories died here, and many Germans gathered to pay respects. With them was Simeon Serapkin, the Soviet ambassador to West Germany. It's the first time in 20 years that a ceremony like this one has taken place in West Germany. It's a direct reflection of the friendship treaty signed last month. But the rally in Berlin gives an indication of just how split Germany is over this new relationship with the Soviets. Many Germans who do not necessarily support the demand for restoration feel that too much truck and trade with the Soviets is a dangerous game. The restoration of the lost lands is one of those German myths that has an almost Wagnerian ring to it. No one really believes it will happen, but it would be almost breaking with national faith to deny that it could indeed happen again. Morley Safer, CBS News, in West Berlin. In Vietnam, fighting was again reported light today, and the U.S. command announced that American troop strength there now stands at 399,500. That's the lowest level in more than three and a half years. Another 11,000 GIs are scheduled to return home within a month.
Hi, folks. I'm Rex Allen. I've been behind the scenes for several years now talking to you about Purina dog chow. But this time, the Purina people have given me the opportunity to step out front with some really good news. You know, you folks have been mighty good to us. You've made Purina dog chow the biggest selling dog food in the country, almost from the very beginning. It finally got to where so many of you were buying so much, <laughs> there wasn't enough to go around. Well, it's taken us a while to catch up. But now we've built two more factories, and it looks like there's going to be plenty. So we'd like to make it up to you. For when there wasn't, we'd like you to have your first pound free. Now, if you just send us a weight circle from a Purina dog chow package, we'll take care of everything. And in the meantime, take a look around your grocery store. Purina dog chow is back. President Nixon attended a midday mass in Washington today in memory of pro football coach Vince Lombardi. Funeral services for Lombardi were held this morning at St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York. And Robert Shackney reports. There had never been a funeral like this for a sports figure. Two whole football teams were there, the Redskins and the Packers, the men that Vince Lombardi had coached. Also representatives of all the other pro football clubs. And some names out of the past like Red Blake of West Point, and from the Packer years, Paul Horning, Bart Starr. There was something of the atmosphere of a state funeral at New York's St. Patrick's Cathedral. More than 3,000 people inside, hundreds more in the streets outside. Celebrating the Resurrection Mass, two bishops, seven other clergymen, and the Archbishop of New York, Terence Cardinal Cook. Mayor John Lindsay and White House Counselor Robert Finch were among the nun's sports dignitaries. In his homily, Cardinal Cook paraphrased St. Paul and said of Vince Lombardi, He has fought the good fight, he has finished the course, he has kept the faith. Robert Shackney, CBS News, New York. The Gibbs High School football squad was practicing in St. Petersburg, Florida today when a bolt of lightning hit. Witnesses said right in the middle of the huddle. Two of the teenage boys were killed, 20 others were hurt. Vanquish is going after the round pain relievers you use for your headache. Look, this leading round one has extra strength but no buffers. Vanquish has both. This leading round one has buffers but no extra strength. Vanquish has both. This leading one has strength but no buffers. Vanquish has extra strength and gentle buffers. It's the only leading pain reliever you can buy that does. Vanquish, the tall one. Hi, I'm Marlene Francis, and I'd like to test your judgment. Which of these antacid tablets would you say is stronger? I mean, which do you think settles more of the acid that causes heartburn or indigestion? Well, once again, the biggest is not the best. The smaller Philips tablet is concentrated, so it's stronger than either of the leading antacid tablets that come in a roll. There is no contest. Philips tablets are stronger. You like them. International experts today listed U.S. inflation, which they called the worst in 20 years, as the world's major economic problem. The annual report of the International Monetary Fund, covering the 12 months ended last April 30th, said the situation threatens the stability of the world's money. The report strongly, but implicitly, suggested tougher U.S. actions, and said the Nixon administration's anti-inflation policy is behind schedule in slowing price and cost increases, also has had a more severe impact on the real economy than anticipated. In the 76 years since the United States has observed Labor Day as a national holiday, the labor movement has undergone many transformations, and the changes are still going on, as Eric Severide notes. Labor Day originated in honor of what used to be called the working class and is now called the blue-collar worker. Those who produce and build with their hands are now a minority. White-collar workers outnumber them by 20 million is fine, no doubt, for the laundry business and illustrates America's shift to a predominantly service and clerical society. The fervent labor movement of New Deal days is now the labor business, and its political cast of mind is changing. Big labor bosses ride in Cadillacs. The Teamsters and Steelworkers have no trouble pledging $35 million to the UAW Strike Fund, which suffers the capitalistic embarrassment of finding too much of its cash tied up in mortgages and bonds. 
New York State AFL-CIO endorses for governor a Rockefeller, a name detested by labor a generation ago, instead of a Goldberg, lifelong champion of organized labor. So the Washington columns and corridors are full of speculation that the traditional Democratic Party coalition, including organized labor, is truly in. And tonight, Nixon Republicans shake 200 leading labor hands in the White House and rub their own in gleeful anticipation. There is a certain labor drift toward the Republicans, only because there is no place else to go as they drift away from the Democrats. And this drift occurs not only because the Democrats are leaderless and disorganized, but because they are too much identified in too many labor minds with rioting students, anti-military manifestations, legal permissiveness, intellectual snobbism, and the rest of the current social scene. George Meany sounds the general theme, though his suggestion that the Democratic Party is being taken over by the far left is as dubious as a proposition that the American press has left with. A drift toward republicanism is not yet an embrace of republicanism. Blue-collar America may like the traditionalism of the republicans in matters of patriotism and order, but they fear the inflation which they now identify with the Nixon regime, which painfully squeezes the middle-aged worker and which can turn them politically right around again if it is not soon checked. The one thing they won't do is to become revolutionary in spirit, something most left-wing intellectuals could never get through their own heads, consequence of which the general political right wing is now colored a deeper blue. An executive of the Caesars Palace Hotel in Las Vegas, Sanford Waterman, has been charged with assault with a deadly weapon, reportedly following a quarrel with singer Frank Sinatra. Sinatra broke off his $100,000 a week engagement in the hotel and left town yesterday. Local lawman said he stormed out of the hotel right after an intense quarrel which ended with a gun being drawn on him. Others reported Sinatra was gambling at high stakes, asked for credit, was turned down. The question of personal rights and flowing hair and army regulations has been bothering the military. Now comes a suggested solution. Retired Colonel Robert Rigg, writing in the Army's General Staff College publication, suggests putting all the long hairs in separate units and letting them compete in maneuvers with other units. They'll find out, Rigg contends, what it is to wear helmets successfully, keep the lice out in combat areas, maintain their flowing locks amid mud and jungles. At Canyon City, Colorado today, a car stopped at the Royal Gorge Bridge, 1,121 feet above the Arkansas River. A man got out wearing a parachute, jumped over, and descended safely between the jagged canyon walls. A companion photographed the descent, then rode a tramway to the bottom of the gorge, met the jumper, and they drove away without identifying themselves. They said they just wanted some pictures official said they violated an anti-littering law against throwing things off the bridge. How about that new Kent menthol? Wow, Kent got it all together. Kent got it all together. Kent has got all together. New Kent menthol 100. Brisk, breezy menthol flavor, exclusive micronite filter, and good, rich taste. They're all together now. All the refreshments of menthol, all the good things of a gift, it's all together. Roasting pans used to be a big cleanup problem. But today, roasting pans come with Teflon. So easy to clean, even the messiest mess doesn't stick. Teflon. So you can use the time after a great meal for something other than cleanup. Our colleague Charles Corral isn't exactly on the road this time, as you'll see in this report from near Chance, Maryland. Time stands still for a lot of Americans on a lazy Labor Day, but here on the Chesapeake Bay, they went so far as to roll time back, back to the 1800s. They did it with the boom of a cannon. And there were the skipjacks, off and racing again, their long, graceful bowsprits slanting across the starting line in the annual race of the Chesapeake Bay Oyster Fleet. Because of the Maryland law that most oyster dredging must still be done under sail, these 19th century craft are all still working boats, but they work in the winter. Today, they race with a crew of friends and relatives mostly getting in the skipper's way. 
We got in the way of Captain Clifton Webster, who's been a waterman on the Chesapeake long enough to duck a swinging boom without even watching it swing. Maybe Roadrunner coming through. <laughs> Captain Clifton had a son and a grandson and a lot of in-laws racing against him today, and he showed them all a thing or two. Likewise, his brother Clyde over there, skipper of the hundred-year-old Susan May, with whom our boat, the H.M. Krentz, was locked in a tight race until Captain Clifton got down to planning strategy. Well, it looks to me like it's uh, horrible in uh, what you call it, still staying out of the shore. You going into the shore? The wind's well, more favorable yeah. under that. Skipjacks are America's last working sailboats. They are broad-beamed and cross-planked and flat-bottomed for sturdiness, not for speed. But they let out all the reefs today, and we will say for the H.M. Prince that in the course of the afternoon, she passed a few boats in all the bay nowadays, as Captain Webster knows very well. There are not too many skipjacks left to pass. There used to be a lot more of these skipjacks. Oh, right my there, blessed, yes, sir. I can remember when I was a boy, that uh, Radiant Tanger Sound here, that uh, we used to work. When I was with my father, we used to work with 200 just working right on one oyster rod. And this thing my father said he's seen it when it was 500 in Europe, he used to oyster. And now there are... Part of sound. So much that... Uh, People's gone, boats is gone, and nobody built them. On a day like this, uh, a waterman seems to be the thing to be, but I imagine it gets pretty cold uh, when you're working in the winter, doesn't it? You can say that twice. <laughs> yes, sir, we've been through now some days that... Uh, the oysters, when you wound them in all day, they were just same as a lump of ice. That cold. It's a lot better to be in a race in September, if you I ask me. So. <laughs> yeah, you set a point there, that's right. Oh, well, there were certain distractions for a captain out here today, among them Miss Delmarva and Miss Chesapeake, and a girl who must go through life remembering that in 1970 she was Miss Crustacean. If we, uh, this breeze holds up, we're catching it, we're catching it gradually. And there was plenty of advice for Captain Webster from the Sunday sailors. And steering isn't made any easier by wives and daughters. The America's Cup, this wasn't. And so finally we lost. At the finish, we were sixth behind the winners, the F.C. Lewis and the Rosie Parks. Never mind, the H.M. Prince had a glorious day. This November, she'll be back to the drudgery of dragging dredges over oyster beds. Today, today she sailed. Charles Carroll, CBS News, on the Chesapeake Bay. That's the way it is. Labor Day, 1970. This is Walter Cronkite, CBS News. Good night. I'm Sid Cherise. Now, I'm not going to tell you my age, because I don't look it. You know, the best way not to look your age is to do something about it. I do. I take good care of myself. I exercise. I try and eat the right foods get plenty of rest, and to be sure that I got enough iron and vitamins, I take a Geritol tablet every day. Geritol. I think it's one of the nicest things a girl can do for herself. You heard what she said. Geritol. Every day. 11.10 p.m. Can't sleep. 11.30. Wide awake. 11.45. Still awake. When you take more than 15 minutes to fall asleep and feel you need help, Take Salmonex as directed for 100% safe sleep. Salmonex is the only leading sleep aid with three medical ingredients to quickly relax you and help you get to sleep. When you take more than 15 minutes to fall asleep, take Salmonex and sleep, sleep, sleep. Direct from our newsroom in New York, in color, this has been the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite. See a day in the life of the United States, a film portrait of America on the day man landed on the moon. Tomorrow night at 9.15, 8.15 Central Time on CBS.